Hello again and welcome back to my channel. Um, I absolutely hate things like graphs and diagrams. <laughs> I don't think I used to as a kid doing technical drawing and maths and all those things. I think I used to quite like colouring in columns and um, seeing these things depicted. Pie charts. <clears throat> um, but spreadsheets leave me um, cold and actually almost hysterical when I've got to do them for my <laughs> doing my accounts and things. I think I'm scared of losing information or doing this, the software thing wrong. Um, so I can't believe that I've ended up doing, um, making diagrams. <laughs> this is like absolutely crazy. This is me yesterday filling 10 pages with these um, felt tip um, spreadsheets to do with my reading. Now, you know, I think I've talked before about my reading diaries of the last uh, 34, I was going to say 25, it's not, years have passed. The last 34 years, this began in 1990. All these are, um, are pages and pages of lists. Every book I've read um, listed and nothing else. So the first book took 24 years to fill. 10 years for this one and so what I thought I'd do is pick out the books that still mean something I remember everything in there there's maybe one or two titles where they leave a blank um, but I just thought I wanted to pause at this moment this summer while I'm thinking about books and reading and look back and think which have been the most important uh, still to me, which are the kind of essential books? I think I, bl I, I blame Helene Hanf and reading all of these books of hers again. These are a reread from 15 years ago, and she talks again and again, all of her books, about her library and how she was limited for space and how just the essential things could be there, the books that really meant something. She talked about the library as a place that you get books to read and that's how you decide which ones you want to go to the bookshop and buy. The books you will live with forever. And that's that's kind of stayed with me. Um, anyway, I thought it would just be an interesting exercise to go through each year and do columns. <laughs> uh, with seasons along the top and down the side each year. There's about two, three, four, five years on each page. You probably can't see this. Um, there's nothing much to see. It's a very basic diagram. There's the six seasons in the year. The, the, the reading year has six seasons, I've decided. That's my title for this video, I think. The reading year has six seasons. And of course, there's spring, summer reading, summer holiday reading. There's autumn, and that's a very particular feeling, autumnal reading. This is where it gets more complicated. Halloween is its own season, of course. Christmas is its own season. And separate to Christmas is winter and wintry reading. Um, I'm not sure I've done it exactly right on all of these, but um, that's 90 to 93. And you can see for each season, I'm picking out a bunch of titles. Um, they're bunched up in spring and summer for these kind of early 90s things, and that's interesting. Look at that. There's no Halloween, Christmas or winter books that really grabbed me in the mid to late 90s, for example. And that's that's interesting to me. I think I put too many in the spring column. I think I'm hoping that some of winter is spring, which is so typical of me. Endlessly optimistic. But you see here, in the early 2000s, I'm getting more Christmas books. And I go back and rediscover Steps Out of Time. I get it in 1999 from Abe Books. Now, it's the book that I read when I was about 10. It's the great time travel novel for kids. And I found it again. Actually, it was only 19 years later. I was 29. Um, and it became a staple for rereading at Christmas. What else is there? 2003 is when I got a whole load of puffins from 
a charity shop in Norwich and I came to Manchester for Christmas and spent the whole time lying on the settee reading kids books and reread Roger Lancelin Green's Robin Hood and his King Arthur and I reread Box of Delights and The Voyage of the Dawn Treader and Prince Caspian and that's interesting that's a kind of turning point and you can see at this point as well that science fiction, fantasy and horror is really coming to the fore again for me. Something's going on. And literary fiction, underlined in these in green. Novels are green, or literary fiction, or contemporary fiction, all in a kind of lime green. Horror, science fiction and fantasy are all lumped together as orange. Uh, and kids' books are blue. Non-fiction is pink. And there's barely any non-fiction in those years that I loved. Biographies, that's what I loved. Literary biographies. So I loved the one of Jacqueline Suzanne, Lovely Me, by Barbara Seaman. Judith Thurman's book on Colette. Lorna Sage's book on herself, Bad Blood. Uh, what else? Edward Gorey. Mark Doty. See, they're all literary biography. Uh, then Serge Gainsbourg. Fistful, Fistful of Gitan by, um, oh, her name is gone, Sylvie Simmons, but it's the most wonderful book about music. And again, as I say, books about rock music and pop music are usually about writing. Uh, then we're into the 2004s, 5s, 6s, so In This House, uh, 20 years ago. Loads and loads of kids' books. Tom's Midnight Garden is where 2004 begins. Now, I remember reading that in Whitby in a guest house. Um, all in one evening. All of these kids' books are kind of reunions, really. Um, the Wombles, Green Smoke, wow, by Rosemary Manning. Another book about a querulous talking dragon by the seaside. And one of the best. Phoenix and the Carpet, Watership Down, Little Women Carries War, Little House on the Prairie, Secrets of Nim, A Giant Under the Snow. They're all reunions. And the, the horror science fiction stuff is slipping away a bit in the 2005s. But what's coming in is a bit of crime I'm discovering, and these are underlined in dark green. I'm discovering a, a, a hankering for a life of crime. <laughs> Shadow of the Wind, Carlos Ruiz Zafon, was a huge turning point, as I've described before, that summer when I threw a book out of the room where I was reading, out of the bedroom. I was reading A.L. Kennedy, and it was so awful. <laughs> I wasn't getting on with it. I just thought, I hate all these characters. I hate this tight assed writing but with no story and that's how it seemed to me and it's how lots of literary fiction seemed to me i was in my last year at uea and lots of the writing that was celebrated there and aspired to seemed very tight assed and plotless and overly ornate for its own sake and self-regarding and that's how literary fiction can sometimes be and so i found that crime writing um, was leaping off the page at me. So I read um, Agatha Christie. And I can see in these years, I'm picking out at Bertram's Hotel, uh, Poirot's Christmas becomes a Christmas read. And the blue carbuncle. I go back to Sherlock. And I discover in 2007, Cozy Mysteries as a genre. And so I read Donald Bain's books based on Murder, She Wrote, the continuing Murder, She Wrote. And that's the kind of <clears throat> the book series that shows the way forward for cosy mysteries in the States. Anyway, I discover uh, Ghost of a Chance, the, the book that begins the series by Yasmin Gailnorn, that incorporates um, supernatural elements and myth with uh crime, a kind of urban fantasy. And that becomes a genre that I fall in love with. Death on the Nile. You can see that there, summer 2007. And I discover Cleo Coyle's 
Coffee House Mysteries, and that's a whole series. Uh, Flamingo Fatale. Um, and Ten Years Beyond Baker Street, which was a novel I read when I was 10. And again, an eBay discovery. And it's the story of Sherlock Holmes and Watson meeting Fu Manchu. So two great um, mystery series converge in this epic novel by K. Van Ash. The kids' books are still going strong, uh, but I go a bit crazy on non-fiction in these years, and lots of my favourite things are, are non-fiction. David Sedaris is there every year. I love all of his books. Um, Truman Capote, I've re I seem to have read a million books about Truman Capote and his letters I read on a cruise ship in 2010 going around the Mediterranean and it becomes one of my favourite books. Winter 2008-9, I read all of Helene Hanf, all of her books at once, one after the next rather. And those are the books I've gone back to just now. I spend all of Christmas 2010 reading the letters of Dirk Bogart. Books of letters become really important, as you see, Dirk Bogart, Catherine Mansfield, um, Scott Fitzgerald. Cat books. Science fiction kind of returns to me slightly as the years go on. Uh, I read A.C. Crispin. I read Flowers for Algernon for the first time. And I get this nostalgia for early 90s books in uh, the remainder shop in Darlington. So I end up rereading lots of things and rediscovering the books that meant a lot in the 90s. I guess it's 20 years later at this point. So I'm up for that kind of nostalgia. Um, lots and lots of, of non-fiction. Tolstoy in the Purple Chair becomes a, a kind of central text for me in 2014. Um, it's quite a turbulent time here with the house falling down and family troubles and Fester Cat dying. Um, and Nina Sankovic's book, Tolstoy in the Purple Chair, which is all about reading and making sense of your life through reading. And she, in that book, reads a book a day for a year. And that was a something I read about three times that year, actually. Seeing these all together is, is so interesting for, for looking at the trends in your life. And that for those years, in my early 40s, it really was non-fiction that was doing it for me. I mean, there's loads of wonderful novels. Longborn by Joe Baker or... Uh, um, pick out another good one. The Paris Wife. Uh, lots of light novels, lots of kind of romance, actually. That's interesting. So I'm reading Jenny Colgan for the first time. I'm discovering contemporary romance and reading lots of Jill Mansell and uh, Carol Matthews. Very funny, sharp, contemporary comic romance. And cosy stuff from the States. Literary fiction has kind of fallen by the wayside a bit, although I do revel in books like Donna Tartt's The Goldfinch, uh, and we are all completely beside ourselves. The book about the oh, about the uh, chimpanzee kept with a family, brought up with a family, and then put back. That's by... I forget her name, but that's a gutting book. So I'm still caught up in literary fiction when it really strikes me. Heft was a great book. Um, A.J. Fickery by, is it Gabriel Levin, who last year published Tomorrow, Tomorrow and Tomorrow. So the trends are very interesting to me. Maybe they're not to anybody else. Um, I'm, just, I'm so proud of myself for actually making a diagram. <laughs> and here's... 1617, 2016 and as you can see, lots and lots of uh, kids' books and genre again. 
Uh, oh, and then around the pandemic, I know there was lots of rereading for me. I had a whole summer in 2020 of rereading favourites, and these diaries came incredibly useful then for reminding me. Um, uh, thrillers come in very seriously. <laughs> I discover how much I love thrillers and so books like Woman in the Window, Gone Girl and Girl on the Train become kind of central texts for those those times. Um, there's another book about chimpanzees, Me Cheetah, by, I forget the fellow's name, but if you ever get a chance to read it, you must. It's about uh, the chimpanzee who was Tarzan's mate in the movies, his pal. And uh, um, the chimpanzee narrates the novel about his fall from fame. It's a, it, it's a novel about Hollywood. Um, very, very funny and dark. Very moving. I realise there's lots of books... Even having done 150 of these videos, there's lots of things I haven't actually talked to you about yet, which is great. <clears throat> and there's lots of books I want to go back and and reread looking at this. The last few years have been very, very full. I don't know if that's a distorting effect of them being more recent, but look at that. That's the pandemic and after. Favourite books. I mean, given that every year there's about 100 books I read. I've picked up a big proportion of them here as favourites. 2023 being especially good. That might just be because it was more recent and they're very vivid. But I did think I was quite good at choosing things last year. And I'm sure that's an effect of doing more of the dipping in. So you jettison things that you aren't going to enjoy quicker. So you sample more broadly and fix on things more accurately. And that, that clearly had an effect. Um, again, lots of non-fiction last year. Some incredible memoirs like Richard E. Grant's Pocket Full of Happiness um, and Susie Quattro's Unzipped. And then that wonderful book about In the Company of Strangers, the Canadian movie. Uh, and Paul O'Grady's memoirs. This year is looking like this. Look, this is the current page. I love this because I thought, should I do this year? Should I start a 10th page and do this year? And of course I was right to, because what you get is a little thing in the top corner representing spring and summer 2024 and all that empty space, which is so hopeful. It makes assumptions that you're gonna be around, <laughs> which, is, which is good. <laughs> and reading as much and enjoying them as much. I've picked out for spring and summer this year, 13 books already as favorites. And I don't know how I'm gonna crunch that down by the end of the year to something more manageable. I see that science fiction, fantasy, horror has done really well this year, but so have actually um, novels, whether they're lighter or uh, more literary. Find Me is the most recent one that I'm clinging to as something fantastic. But, you know, fantasy like Impossible Creatures and science fiction like Principle of the Moments, horror like Last Days. There's a brilliant kids book in The Pig Man. I've got, I've picked out three non-fictions that I've loved. Ordinary Thunderstorms and, sorry, Non-fiction, The Psychopath Test, Wild Mind and Six A Black Blackstock Gardens by Jerry Potter. And what I love is that they're all very different books. Maybe after all this time I've learnt to uh, ricochet across genres more nimbly, perhaps. I don't know. I just love having a kind of aerial view of, of all this reading. There must be something, some conclusion I can draw from that. What I can do is read down the columns. It's not just about the time. It's about reading down so I can go down the Halloween column and see what has been amazing at Halloween. Uh, 
and Christmas. It's really useful for that. And I remember things like the fact that The Anubis Gates by Tim Powers is a really dark, spooky book that I adored in 1991. And I think I've read it again since, but I don't have a copy of it. This is going to send me back to um, YouTube. Not YouTube. This is YouTube. <laughs> send me back to eBay buying stuff. And I'd forgotten about reading all of Kim Wilkins's novels over Halloween 2002 and then 2003. She's an Australian fantasist and kind of dark horror person. And her four books that I read at that point Fallen Angel, Resurrectionists, uh, Grimoire, and The Infernal. I don't know if they're in print, but they should be, because they were wonderful. Anyway, I'm going to go. I could sit flipping through these for ages. And I love the fact that my Halloween column has Dracula Frankenstein, and then Nancy Drew, Secret of the Old Clock, or The Mummy's Case for the Hardy Boys. You could do worse than just go back to all of these for Halloween. Halloween in 2016 meant The Wolves of Willoughby Chase, Stick of the Dump, The Borrowers and The Wizard of Earthsea. Fantastic. Anyway, I'm going to go. <coughs> I hope my spreadsheets haven't bored you daft. <laughs> I'll see you again soon in the next episode. Goodbye.